There we go. <laughs> All right, welcome to today's program, everyone. We're really excited today. It's a really special time for us here at Kona Historical Society. Um, and we appreciate you taking time out of your Wednesday to uh, be with us. So um, I am joined here with Pauline and John, um, John Kawano. Many of you probably know Pauline and we're gonna introduce you today to John Kawano, who is a really special partner on this project we're introducing today. Um, so uh, this project, or today's project was funded by Hawaii Council for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we are really grateful for their support. This program is gonna have, um, or this project is gonna have really lasting impacts for many, many years. If you haven't been to a From the Collections with Kona Historical Society, I wanna tell you a little bit about what we do here, or what we do during this program. Um, this program is meant to bring things from our archive that maybe don't get shared all the time um, and just share them with you, hang out together, talk story about them. Um, we usually try and include uh, other community members that we haven't spoken to in a while. So in the past, we've done uh, donkey baseball. We've looked at baking um, in Kona. So and you can check out those programs online. They are uploaded to YouTube and to our Facebook. Today is a little different. Today, instead of pulling something out of our archives, we are celebrating adding something into our archives. And we are adding today a video of Pauline Nishida Miller, who is one of our interpreters at the Kona Coffee Living History Farm. Um, and so today you're gonna see a premiere, a preview of the video um, that, that John has created. Um, and before we get started, I wanna give a little bit of an introduction to both of our guests here today. So many of you, I am sure, are familiar with Pauline. Uh, she has been a history interpreter at the Kona Coffee Living History Farm for nearly a decade and shares a special connection with that story. Pauline grew up on a coffee farm in the 1950s in Honau Now. She spent her career in the insurance industry in Los Angeles, California, and returned back here to Kona in 1987, where she worked for the State of Hawaii Department of Human, Re uh, Human Services until 2008. Around that time is when she found us and began interpreting for us at the farm. So she's been doing it about 10 years. Um, she, she found a connection there, uh, especially because she grew up around the Uchida family, who's the family that lived on the Kona Coffee Living History Farm. So she had a little bit of a connection to it. She had remembered going to school with them and she had even been uh, the flower girl for one of the family weddings. Um, so this was an op a special opportunity for her. Pauline is here live with us, so I'm going to give her a chance to um, say hello. And Pauline, if you could just tell us a little bit about what this project has meant to you. Okay, hi everybody. I'm so happy and honored to be here today to share with you the Kona Coffee Farm story. I'm glad that this is going to be preserved and put in the archives for future use. As the sun say, the third generation, I feel it very important that this be preserved for the future as I um, have noticed specifically in our family, the Yonsei, which is the fourth generation, does not know anything about the history. So I am very happy that this part is going to be preserved in our archives. Thank you Thank so you. much, Paul. Thank you, Pauline. And we will get to have a Q&A with her a little bit later. So if you've got questions for Pauline, um, you can put them in the chat now and we'll get to them. Uh, but we will get to talk story with her plenty after we view the, the video. Um, so with help from uh, th this grant program, we were able to uh, record Pauline, um, both doing her interpretation of the farm, but also telling about her own story and uh, her own life growing up. Um, so, I want to introduce our project partner, John Kuwano. Um, he is who filmed it for us, and um, and he's here for the Q and A as well. So if you have questions for him, it seems like a lot of us here at Kona Historical Society get connected because of our archives and what they might hold for us, what they might share about our families. I know that's the story I have with getting connected with Kona Historical Society, and it turns out that's John as well and Pauline. Um, so John, we met a few months ago and quickly discovered a special connections to our, um, to our archives. 
John is part of the Oi family. Some of you might remember them as the as really prominent photographers uh, based here in Kalakekua. And we actually found his family in our archive. In fact, Pauline even remembers that family as well. Uh, so a little bit about John. Um, he was born Jonathan Tomio Kawano and his name for his grandfather, uh, Tomiyoshi. His grandparents were farmers in Waimea and his father was born and raised here. He later went to Colorado for college where he met John's mom who is from Denver. John was born and raised in Denver, Colorado and lived there for 30 years before moving to his grandparents' house in Waimea um, where he currently resides. He worked in reality television production for High Noon Entertainment for 10 years. Uh, and currently John works in advertising and media consulting, which is actually how he was introduced to KHS. Um, he even was here in 2016 filming for the National Park Service filming at KHS. So John, I would love if you uh, gave us a, a little hello and told us a little bit about what this project has meant to you. I'm actually going to put up some photos of your family as you're talking Perfect. on our um, oops, so sorry, on our on the screen. So we have some photos that we found of our archive of your family. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, this is a very special project. Um, and it's been hard to kind of put in towards um, kind of the emotions on, on working um, on this project. Um, so my great grandparents, the always um, actually grew up um, or, or lived, excuse me, um, blocks away from Kona Historical Society. So, um, you know, just to, to, to have them a few blocks away and, and um, just to be in the house with um, uh, Pauline uh, just brought me to a place where I could see and understand um kind of how that generation lived um and i, I it was special because um i just felt very connected with my roots uh being in there and um as as pauline said too that my generation the yonsei generation um there, there's so much too that we you know um have yet to discover and learn about um our our, our family's history too so um just being a part of this project um, you know, help, helps me learn and, and be connected um, um, to, to my family, so. Yep. Thanks, John. So I wanted to just point out a few um, photos that we pulled from the archive, some that John had never seen before, correct? Correct. So we have here, um, oh, let's see if I can go backwards. So here we have your, is this your great grandfather or your great great grandfather? A uh, great great grandfather, I believe. Um, and I, yeah. Yeah. So there he is, and he's one of the one of the original photographers in your family. And we had his portrait here um, inside our archives. This other photo, I'm not sure if we'll be able to identify people. We probably need to sit down with Julie in the archive and like That's take a minute to look at them all. But I wanted to include um, this nice photo of a bunch of Hawaii photographers. They were at a party, um, and it it says in our record that your that uh, both Mr. and Mrs. Um, mm -hmm. Oi were in the photo. Yes, correct. They're they're kind of front and center, I believe. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Right there. And then here we've got a photo of, that's your uncle David, right? Uh, my, my dad's cousin, David Owe, yes. All right, yeah. Oh, your dad's cousin. Okay, and you knew yes. him, correct? I'm sorry? You, kn yes, you knew Yes, we're, we're very close. And, and um, he, so he went to the Air Force Academy, um, which is out in Colorado Springs. So we actually kind of grew up with him being, uh, being Uncle David. Um, but he was, he was uh, a big part of our, our, our lives and we, we definitely looked up to him. So uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely a, a very close person in our lives. And here he is right in the, the KHS archives. So here he is with um, Sherwood Greenwell who inside the uh, H.N. Greenwell store. Looks a little different today, but that's what they, <laughs> that's back in 1989. And then here's my last slide here. So the photo on the left, from what I understand, those must be some of your maybe great, great aunts or cousins, um, Amy, Patricia, and Florence Oi inside the studio. So inside the Oi family studio. Um, yes. And it said it was taken by their mother. And then that yes, photo- Yes, and, and Amy, the one on the left is actually my grandma. Oh, that's your grandma. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Yes, yes. Wow, so this, this is have... incredible, yeah. Yeah. And then this photo here, this is not your family, this is the Kawahara family, but 
um, it was taken by your family. So this is an example of yeah. a type of photos. I believe, Pauline, did you say that the Oi family took a portrait of your family at some point as well? Yes, they did. Yes, yeah. and I still have the photo. <laughs> oh, so cool. We'll have to get a copy of that for John. Okay. So lots of connections right. made here. All right. So um, it's now, so it's time for the part we're all excited for, which is watching Pauline on film. Um, thank you so much, John, for sharing with us. Again, if you have questions for John or connections with John, he's still here to learn more about his family. Um, mm -hmm. You know, put them in the Q&A or in the chat. We'll get to them after we're done watching the video. The video is going to be about 20 minutes. Um, and then afterwards will be the Q&A. So make sure you're getting your questions written down that you have them. We'll, we should have plenty of time to talk story afterwards. Um, and we're going to have John, we're going to give him a few minutes to get set up here so he can play it. Um, and he's going to go ahead and play the video for us. John, are you ready? Yes. Let's get this here. here and let me know too on uh in terms of uh we had to do a, a little little backwards way here with um uh the, the playback quality was a little tough to to get uh to play in zoom so we're gonna do it kind of the old-fashioned way here uh let me know too uh, in terms of uh um if it looks straight John, if you angle it down just a little bit. There you go, perfect. And I want—I don't know if you, you probably didn't see in the chat, but you have got some family watching. I do, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> My name is Pauline Nishita Miller. I was born and raised about seven miles from here on a coffee farm. I'm the eldest of five girls, and we are the third generation, and we're known as the Sansei. The Japanese people immigrated to Hawaii during the 1800s and early 1900s. They were contracted by the US government to come over and do sugarcane work, which is on the other side of the island. Conditions were very, very poor. The working conditions and living conditions were very poor. A lot of the immigrants ran away. And those that stayed, you know, worked really hard trying to end their contract. So they all came over to Kona and did coffee farming, tenant farming. This house is very, very important to me. I lived in a house just like this. And so it's very um, important for me to preserve the house. Mr. and Mrs. Uchida came from Japan and they had five children here. The eldest son, Masao, stayed here with his family until 1994. His children were third generation, Sansei, just like me, and I went to school with them. And that's why it's so, so the house is so important to me. Very, very important. And I think it needs to be preserved for history's sake. Um, every morning, Lady of the house goes to the garden to gather the vegetables for the day. So let's go to the garden, which is located right across the yard here. Okay. self-sustaining life here. All the vegetables are grown. And we also have, we also have suriki, which is a plant here that looks like a taro. And we will harvest some of that plant. And we 
we cook the stuff of it and uh, just cut the leaves off. And I step the <laughs> And this is a leaky. Only the stem is edible. The leaves and the root is not edible. And it's like taro, where uh, the Hawaiians eat taro, and the root is what they make the taro from. But suiki is edible, only the stem. They all look alike, so you have to know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So protein every day, um, Japanese eat eggs. They raise some chickens, and so now I'm going to gather some eggs for protein. Okay. So right now I'm going to cook the rice. Okay. And I'm going to light the fire to cook the rice. Wood that we're using is coffee wood. We never ever have to look for coffee wood because when the farmer trims the coffee trees or prunes the coffee trees, after pruning, it's all cut up and laid in a coffee field. And it's the chore of the children of the house to go out and bring back all the wood to use for cooking and also the bath. So here we have it all prepared here. Being that they ate a lot of rice, rice came in a hundred pound cotton sack. So that sack was very important. Mom made all the clothing from that. Okay. She made blouses, blouses, and then the underwear for the men. Okay, underwear for the men. And little school bags for the children. Okay. It was used for almost everything. My uh, apron here, the dish towels, and mom even made the ceiling with the rice bag. And there in the corner, over the kitchen table, you can see the rice bag, and you will also see it in the rest of the house. So the rice bag was very, very important. All the clothing was made from it. To learn how to cook rice, because if they didn't know how, um, it was said that they won't find a husband. <laughs> They have to know how to cook rice. <laughs> We're going to uh, prepare some vegetables now. So I'm preparing some vegetables here. Um, we also had some eggplants here. Delicious. Okay. The there, there's a skin on it, so we peel the skin off and it's like a celery, but it's very, very porous. Um, I have burnt the rice, um, but that doesn't go to waste because the children just love the burnt rice. They sprinkle a little salt on it and punch away at it. So I understand that mom sometimes burns the rice on purpose. <laughs> This will simmer a little bit and it should get hot enough so we can I make egg on it. Is the rice pot lid just made from wood? Oh, uh, the lid? Yes. The lid is made of wood. And this pot is called a hagama. It's very old. It came from Japan. This is Uchida brought it with her. Very nice, fresh eggs. 
I use the green onion, spring onion, and cut a few of it to uh, put in the eggs. The coals from cooking the rice, I'm laying some eggplant on it to roast the eggplants. Okay, we never want to waste the coals. They come in very handy for roasting. Potatoes or corn can be put on it too. So we'll just leave this here for a while and roast. I can start making the egg. So this is um, an iron skillet. And this is a cheetah cooked almost all of the food in this iron skillet. So all they had was the rice block, the iron skillet, and a little uh, pot there. We used to make stews and anything soupy. <laughs> so not very many utensils, just the three of these. And hot water was uh, put on this uh, heat in these kettles. And so we have our egg. Many times during the day, the whole house will be filled with smoke. So we will be coughing. There's no vent or anything here. It's just natural here. Stuff like this. Um, my grandma had a stove like this. We we had a kerosene stove like that. So that is a kerosene stove, and my family had one of those. And I think it is ready. So I'm gonna get the zuliki there. So I'm going to just cook it together with the zuliki. So I'm going to skin it. Roasted eggplant. Let's try to skin it. Yeah, it's 
perfect. <laughs> if you want to move that part, they invented this little tool to move the rice pot. This is how it works. Very simple. In this case, I'm taking this over here. Oh, the rice is so perfect. <laughs> I'm so proud of the rice. Um, many of the Japanese, all of the Japanese were Buddhist, and so um, we are going to have a little offering for the Buddhist shrine. So the first scoop of rice would go in this little container for the Buddhist shrine. The lady of the house has everything cooked and stuff. She will then make some coffee. Drinking tea. So a lot of the immigrants who came, they were farming coffee and so they had to learn how to drink coffee also. My family never drank coffee. My mom and dad never drank it. My dad though in his later life started and he just loved it. And I drink it now, but when we were growing up, we lived on a farm, but never drank coffee. <laughs> so we have this little grinder that mother, mother uses every morning. and there's some so this also serves as an alarm clock so when the children hear the grinding it's time for them to get up okay and those that lag behind will probably smell the aroma of the coffee and then get up okay so that's how the coffee is made nice way to wake up so we have two um, rice balls and then some eggs Every day it's egg omelet. Eggs. This sounds very cute. Some egg plant. And I have some. Uh, Reddish sticks, so just stick that there and then. The farm and he takes it to the farm and he hangs it on a coffee tree like this, and at lunchtime he'll get it and then um, eat his lunch. So on the bottom, Rice for him. Okay. Let's put it in here. And it kind of keeps the rice from getting spoiled, also, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And um, probiotic is the top section of the lunch pail. And we would put the same thing that we did for the children. So, something. Okay. And as I said, when the chickens don't lay eggs, we hope somebody went fishing. 
And, and as I said, when they go fishing, you know, they, they always share with their neighbors and even vegetables when they have a lot, they will share with their neighbors and in return, they might get something that they don't have. And with the fish, they usually dry the fish because there's no refrigeration. Piece of orange. Sticks of flesh. So here is fudge. So when he gets up, he, he will take this to the field and hang it on the coffee table. And the children will take this to school and, and they will put it in a little bag made out of the rice bag together with their school books and off to school they go. And many, many of you may have been wondering what this is. This is our filtering system. Okay, filtering system. This is a Bull Durham tobacco bag. Okay, and we have a sample right here. So way back, Grandpa and Dad used to smoke Bull Durham tobacco. These bags were very, very useful for uh, filtering the water. Once in a while, Grandpa and Dad will gift one of the children with this, but you have to be almost a perfect child. Study hard in school, no fighting with your siblings, no talking back to your parents, and then you might be gifted the one with this. And it was really hard to come by. If you had one, you'd be the hero the whole year. So the boys kept their marbles in here, and the girls who kept their little trinkets and stuff. And so if you had one, you'd go to school, and you show off, okay, because you're a hero, you're, you're a perfect child. So I never got one. <laughs> oh, wait. Just the bathhouse. So this is the bathhouse, and this is a tub where they bathe in. It is heated by burning coffee wood on the outside, and every night, um, it, it was my job to make the furo, you know, and so when I was in the coffee field, I would be sent home a little early to start the furo. And I loved making the fire, so um, just made it outside here, okay, using the coffee sticks. So besides cooking, we use the coffee sticks to heat the bath. We go back into the bathroom and the bathing routine is getting here, undress, and we would scoop one pail of water, this one pail of water, set it here, and you would sit there and soak up with this one pail of water. Then you would, you're allowed one more pail of water in here and to rinse yourself. Then you go into the tub and soak. So everybody did that. And mom usually goes last, and by the time she gets there, there's hardly any water, and the water is cold. <laughs> the next night, the same thing happens again. And as I said, once, maybe once a week, they'll change the water, and in time of drought, it's used for the yard or for laundry. We're headed to the outhouse. We have an outhouse, it's a two-seater, and at night, when you go to the bathroom, you must take a kerosene lantern. In our family, we always have to be friends before we go to sleep, because in the middle of the night, when you get up and want to go to the bathroom, nobody will go with you if you're not friends <laughs> with your sisters. And you know, there's boogeymans and obake. Obake is the uh, Japanese <laughs> ghost, <laughs> and it's really scary. So take a lantern and wake one of the sisters up and have them go with you. <laughs> toilet paper, they didn't have any toilet paper, so they used newspaper or the pages of the Sears catalog. This is our outhouse. And it's a two-seater. Why did it have two seats, you know? So more than one person can go <laughs> away. <laughs> I mean, they were all two-seaters. This room is a sewing room. And this is so special because there's a room dedicated just for sewing and ironing. This is the cheetah would sit here to do her sewing after she's done with all the kitchen 
hour. This is the children would sit here to do her sewing after she's done with all the kitchen uh, work. And we like to think that she took a moment and just sat here and relaxed and enjoyed the scenery. There are no tall trees here, so she could see the ocean and she could feel the trade winds, the sea breeze come and refresh her. So this was a really nice spot where she sat and did her sewing. Did she sew just for her family or did she or did would, would they sew for other people too? Uh, oh, mostly for the family, but um, she did sew for other people to make a little extra money. And she even did some ironing for other people to supplement their income. Things like blouses were made, blouses like this. Even, even the underwear was made for the men. It's the rice bag scene. They still have prints on them. So we're in the parlor now, and I'd like to tell you about the pictures on the wall. The first picture is of a mountain. A lot of people say that that looks like Mount Hood, okay? but uh, the family here probably saw that picture and it reminded them of Mount Fuji. So they framed it and they look at it and think of Japan, their home. Okay? But I think it's Mount Hood in Oregon. <laughs> this photo is a Japanese school graduation. So Japanese school was held after public school you would have to go to another location, usually a Buddhist church hall, and get about an hour of Japanese. And this is graduation. And you can see that they've all adapted to Hawaii because they all have days on. They've been educated. It's really important. Every day after his hard work on the farm, he comes home, he takes a bath, he has his meal, he puts on his little kimono, and he sits here in this corner. We'll sit here and he would light up his tobacco and he would start reading his paper. Um, it was very difficult to get news in Hawaii. We were so isolated that Masao subscribed to the Hawaii Hochi, which came out of Oahu. Okay. This is a 1939 copy. And this is Princess Elizabeth celebrating her 13th birthday. When Masao read the paper and came across places, he would always refer to his world map and look up the places. Learn a lot from reading the paper. And he really, really enjoyed it because this paper also came in Japanese. But in Japanese. Mr. Uchida. Daisaku made sure there was a study room for his children to study. Initially, they studied on a low desk, Japanese style, while sitting on this cushion called a zabuto. They probably studied this way. But they quickly changed to the American way of study. We have a desk, a chair, and we even have a typewriter. These are the books that the children use. They were English books, and they kept up with their culture. So there's lots of Japanese books for the children. The children read these books. These are the books that the children use. They were English books, and they kept up with their culture. So there's lots of Japanese books for the children. The children read these books. School schedule in Kona was very different from the rest of the state because of the coffee. So August, we were on vacation because from August to November was the heavy coffee season and the children were needed at home to harvest the coffee. So we were the only ones on a different schedule here in the state. And in the late 60s, the school and the community wanted to participate in football because we were never in school during football season and that's what they wanted. So the schedule was changed to regular schedule. I am proud to say that the Konawana High School Wildcats football team, they're always there. They come in their division tops every year. So this concludes the tour of the house. Thank you so very much for coming and sharing this with with me and also for helping with the preservation of this site. It is very, very important for me uh, to have this house uh, preserved in history. It is my childhood. Okay? Things changed. 
uh, along the way. And my generation, the Sansei, most of them left the island and went to the mainland for college. So it is very important that I preserve the history of this house. Thank you so much again for coming. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Pauline, just listening to Pauline puts me right at ease and I'm sure I'm seeing all the comments from people. I'm gonna make sure to read these out to Pauline. Um, so I do wanna say, John and Pauline created such a high quality video for us that Zoom isn't even able to stream it clearly. So I know pr probably some of you had a little bit of pixelation. Don't worry, this is gonna be up on our YouTube at a full resolution. We just wanted a chance to premiere it together and to talk story, to reminisce, to ask some questions of John and Pauline and make additional connections. So check back on YouTube um, later on, probably next week, we'll have it up there as well. Um, all right, so I actually only see thank yous, no questions yet. Um, so let me read you some of these uh, thank yous, Pauline, and to you, John, people wanna know so um, I want you to know, Pauline, your sisters are tuning in from California, Lena and Marcia, or Marsha, sorry. And then um, we have a comment that says, Pauline makes farm life stories so relatable because of her natural style and personal references. Great job. Great demonstration to Pauline. And let's see, on Facebook, we ha you have some old coworkers uh, letting you know that they love watching you. So now's the time we can, we have Pauline all to ourselves, you guys. I can see there's a lot of people still on. We have her all to ourselves along with John and we can ask as many questions as we like. Um, so if you wanna put them in either the Q and A or the chat or on Facebook, we will get you, we will get your, get your questions whichever way you ask them. Um, I had a story that I, and I wanted to see if Pauline could tell. Um, so the video that we showed today is only a portion. Um, we ended up getting a lot of footage of Pauline and we'll end up with a video that's an, of an hour long of Pauline. There's so much to share in that house. Um, but one of the stories Pauline and I talked about in the process of filming was about um, how the coffee families would, the coffee farming families usually during coffee harvest would work every day. But Pauline told me that her family didn't. They took a day off to go do something fun. What did your, can you tell that story, Pauline? What did your family do on your guys' day off? Oh, sure. Yes, even in the midst of coffee season, when everybody worked seven days a week, on Sunday, we did not work. We, we were Catholics, so my dad would go fishing early Sunday morning, and we would go to church with my mom. And after church, we go home, change our clothes, jump in the Jeep, and my mom would take us to the beach. And there were five of us, five girls, and we were like wild animals, uh, take, riding the Jeep down to the beach. And as soon as we got there, we would jump out and jump in the ocean and we would be swimming all day long. And in the afternoon, we'd wait for my father to come in with his canoe, because he's out fishing. So he comes in and he has dinner ready. And so now it's time to go home. So mom and dad says, okay, kids, let's go home. Then it takes half an hour to find us because we dive in the water and we hide. Oh. We don't wanna go home, but we had Sunday off every day of the year, even when it was full coffee season and people worked on Sundays, we had the day off. So I feel very, very thankful for that. <laughs> We got Sunday off, but we worked hard the rest of the week. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you had to make up for it because all the coffee had to be picked one right. way or the other. Right. Um, we had one person who put in the Q&A. He just wanted to say that um, this story reminds him of his mother's stories. This is from Tom. His mother's stories growing up in a farm in Riddle, Oregon. I think that's one of the cool things um, about the farm is we find people with connections all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. These houses remind them of their grandparents or remind them of their families or just the work ethic or the way that, you know, the way that um, you had to be on a farm reminds them of their own families, wherever they're from, Hawaii or otherwise. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with us, Tom. John, did you have any questions for Pauline? Did I? 
Yeah, anything you're so. I know we've spent so much time with her, you and yeah. I. Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get to be so amazing? <laughs> no, you were amazing filming this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the things that I should uh, throw out there too. Not a question, but Pauline is like a, a producer's dream in terms of like she doesn't. You don't. I, I didn't need to do anything. Literally, just hold, hold the camera. Uh, so I think everyone should know how 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 amazing and how easy it was to, to do my job. <laughs> yeah, we got well, most things in one take. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, well I, I'm so happy it was done because I think it's so important to preserve the story. It's a yeah. wonderful story, isn't it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. John, yeah. Absolutely. Huh? Yeah. And I think, too, just being a part of it, too, and, and being in the house, it was just, it gave me chicken skin, gave me goosebumps, just, you know, cause it reminded me of my, my, gen, my, my family. And, and uh, it's interesting to see too, like it, it helps you kind of learn about where you, where you come from. And, and I think just even little things that um, I noticed that my grandparents would do in, in the house, um, you know, um, and I, I'd always wonder why certain things were done that way, but it was, it was, um they were so resourceful um and it, it's just just being in that house too and, and i can't wait for my dad to to be in there too because you just learn about your history just being in the house and it's mm -hmm. just a, a a great feel just feeling to be to, to, to hear you do uh talk about it and and yeah so yeah so th thank you for allowing me to, to film you <laughs> thank you well it's been real fun for me because i've lived that life sort of and to to relive it and share it with people it, it's so uh it makes me happy yes. I, I want to share it all <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. pauline we had a question in from someone named pat and she was wondering how big the farms were and did you grow, um, did the families grow their own rice? What was the land like, the landscape, and what did they grow? <laughs> the farms were, <clears throat> they were kind of small family farms, maybe 10 acres, five acres per family. And we did not grow rice. I, I myself thought rice came from Japan, but it comes from California. <laughs> so in Hawaii, we get the California rice. Rice from Japan is really good and it's expensive. <laughs> And, and that's where, you know, we get the rice bag, the cotton rice sack, which is just so important in the family. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, uh -huh, go ahead. Um, no, I was just going to mention that these days the farms are bigger. The smaller farms are, you know, yeah, family run farms are, you know, slowly closing up and bigger farms are existing now. Um, we had another question. Oh, it looks like Pat had a follow-up. Do we did we have farm animals <laughs> yes. on, on the coffee farms? Yes, we sure did. We had the donkey because the donkey was the one that uh, hauled the coffee to the house where the mill is. So they had donkeys. We had chickens for the eggs, mm -hmm. and um, there would usually be a cat and a dog. Um, my dad had a horse also. I, I don't know really what he used it for. He would just ride it around the property once in a while. And some families would have a, a cow, you know, just, just for their own yeah, and milk, milk. Um, cat, yeah, cat for pet and dog, yeah. The donkey was the most uh, valuable because it hauled the coffee way back. And did your family have a donkey, Pauline? Yes, we did. We oh. did. I, I remember the donkey <laughs> oh, okay. in the later years. So the donkey was already in the pasture. We weren't, uh, my parents weren't using it to haul the coffee because they had a Jeep. The Jeep. I just love that Jeep. We went everywhere with the Jeep and um, it lasted forever. And they were the old army army jeeps after world war one there was a surplus so all the farmers were able to uh, get an army jeep that replaced the donkey yeah. 
I, I drove the Jeep uh, without a license for a very long time on the farm. Somebody had to drive the Jeep to pick up the coffee. So I was the driver of the Jeep <laughs> for a long Someone's time. Someone's gonna do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to learn to drive. I bet yeah. roads were no problem for you after the farm. <laughs> and one day I flipped the Jeep over because the farm is no real roads, roads, and it just flipped over. And so I was really scared going to my come home. <laughs> but he said, that's okay. Things like that happen. And then he just brought his truck and <laughs> pulled the Jeep up. <laughs> so everything was okay. No, no, nobody got hurt. No damage to the Jeep. <laughs> yeah. So we have a, a question in the Q&A. Um, uh -huh. What was the food, the, what type of food did the family eat in the morning for breakfast or was lunch the first meal of the day? Um, breakfast. They had breakfast. Usually it would be uh, miso soup with some rice, maybe, or uh, fruits like orange or papayas. Orange or papayas, yeah. Mostly, I, uh, my recollection is mostly they had a little bit of rice and pancakes. Uh, my grandma used to make pancakes also, so it would be that. <laughs> Small breakfast. Small breakfast, yeah. yeah. Well, two big breakfasts makes me sleepy. I wouldn't want to go <laughs> work like, with a big breakfast. There's a really yeah. nice reflection here. This isn't a question, but a really nice reflection I wanted to make sure you heard. This is from Lori Uchimura. She says, thank you for saving such an important piece of Kona heritage. It reminds me of the years when I lived with mom and dad on Uchimura on their farm in Kainaliu. Uh, just loved when dad made the photo fire, pick, uh, picked and processed the coffee, drying on the Hoshidana. I know they even had a donkey. Oh. Such a oh, shared that's, story, that's huh? Nice. Yes, I'm so happy to hear all this. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, oh, we have another question from Pat. They're asking, did everyone work on the farm? You said you um, mentioned that your dad would fish sometimes. Mm -hmm. So was um, everyone working on the farm or how did that work? Uh, in my family, um, in my family, my dad went out to work. He worked for the county and uh, he got Saturday and Sunday off. So Saturdays, he would work on the farm. Sunday, we had the day off. So that's when he did his fishing. And he had a canoe down at the city of refuge. And, and he was a real good fisherman. We, we had lots of fish, you know, for our meals. And uh, my mom, uh, took care of the farm. And in later years, though, she uh, went to work as a cashier at one of the markets here because we were growing up, the girls were growing up, and we needed more, you know. Um, they had to provide for five girls, and I know it was very hard for my parents. So, yeah, we all tried to work together and try to make it. Right. Well, we have answered all the questions. Let's see. Oh, we got one and one more question about school. Did you have a school? So maybe did you have like a schoolhouse or were you taught at home? Uh, we had a school. Now, um, the rodeo ground here near the city of refuge, that, that was where the school was. In the year that I was to start kindergarten, there was a big earthquake and the school was flattened. So so there was no school. Um, so I started kindergarten at a little building, which used to be the Japanese school. Today, it is known as SKIA, mm -hmm. South Kona Educational Association. Mm -hmm. And it was a building and kindergarten was underneath the building. So our floor was dirt and it wasn't very high. And my teacher was very tall. She broke all the light bulbs that oh. were sticking out. And she had to sort of bend over and teach school because it was so low. But that's, we, we went to kindergarten there. <laughs> In first grade, it was upstairs. And by then they built a new school. So uh, there was school. So we have elementary schools 
And then we had just one high school here. So after elementary school, you know, you had to catch the bus and go to the high school. So we did have a full school uh, curriculum. Thank you, Pauline. Well, we're coming to the end of our program together. I thought we could end with maybe just a quick little reflection from each of us on what the project meant to us or how it impacted impacted us. Um, maybe we could start with John and then you can, and then you can go next, Pauline. Okay. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, kind of how I said early, earlier, um, you know, this is kind of, they, they say legacy project, but I think really that would be kind of the defining word I would use um, for me is, is doing something that, you know, um, it doesn't feel like work or, or doing, you know, for me, it's just like something that is, is so important thing to, um, you know, not everyone gets and, and understands the, the value of, of uh, tracing your, your roots. And I think that's um, something that you guys um, at, at Kona Historical understand and, and do such an amazing job with is, is help, helping people connect to their their, their roots and, and um, understand the, the stories of the generations that came before. So, um, and, and for me, I, I feel like I'm just just opening up the books and, and really starting to learn about, um, you know, this side. Um, I think not growing up in Hawaii, it's, you know, there, there's so many things that, you know, you missed out on, but, but that's why a big reason why I, I moved out here is I wanted to connect with this side and, and um, learn learn my my family's history out here. So uh, it's been a really really special um, project to work on, and yeah, it's getting getting dusty in here. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so thank you. Guys. We are we are so grateful to you, John. I guess we'll we'll end with Pauline's thoughts, but I'll I'll add to to what you said. Um, as a person who also came to Kona to reconnect with my Portuguese heritage and in the archives and our archives, um, I'm just continuously encouraged by what is held at Kona Historical Society. Um, it's so exciting to have another connection made. Um, you know, they've been made for years and years at Kona Historical Society, and I can't wait to see what else there is. Um, so I hope this makes it to the viewers out there, I hope this makes you even more curious about what might be in our archives, ways we can partner, ways we can keep sharing Kona stories. Um, so Pauline, let's end with your reflection. What are you, what are any final thoughts on the project, on um, being able to finally film this and have it documented for forever, um, and just how you're feeling? Oh, I, I just feel so good about it and being part of it. I, I, I can't believe it, you know, that I'm part of this. And um, I have, I know now that it is so important to preserve it and to have it for the future. And um, in the process of me getting to this point, you know, uh, getting connected with the historical society and working at the farm, it, it was something, uh, I think I lived for all my life. I really, really enjoy it. I enjoy it. And um, um, I enjoy sharing the story. And now with it being preserved, I'm much more happy, you know, very content that it's being saved. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. I am so, so grateful to Pauline and John and to um, Hawaii Council for Humanities for funding this project. I know every staff member, every past staff member is relieved to know that Pauline's story is now safely in the archive for future use. Um, before we end the Zoom, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, just a reminder that this will be up. So if you didn't catch all of it, this is going to be uploaded to our YouTube um, and we'll have a little bit, we'll have a, a higher quality version up there as well. If you want to watch just Pauline's interpretation. Um, so you can check it out there uh, probably early next week or on Facebook right away. It'll be uploaded to Facebook right away. Um, the expanded version, so it'll be an hour or longer, that'll be kept in our archives. If you're interested in seeing that or interested in doing some research in the archive, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to get you set up with an appointment um, with our collections manager, Julie. Lastly, when the Zoom ends today, there's going to be a little survey. It's just six questions. If you have a couple extra minutes or seconds to just uh, select or to, to fill out your survey, that would really help us out um, in our evaluations. 
Um, and just lastly, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone being here today for all the hard work that went into this project. Um, it's going to be used in many ways. Uh, we're also going to include it for school curriculum even. So it's going to be in classrooms across the state uh, next year, hopefully next school year, hopefully. Um, so we're so grateful for that. Mahalo, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.